So welcome to this, our first Authors of Mystery talk panel. Tonight's topic is setting the Lone Star State. With me are Laura Oles, Helen Curry Foster, and K.M. Hodge. I'm going to read everybody's bios real quick, and then we'll have the authors tell us about some of their books. Laura Oles is a photo industry journalist and crime writer. Her debut mystery, Doors of Bad Men, is an Agatha nominee, a Claymore Award finalist, and a Killer Nashville Reader's Choice nominee. She is also a Writers League of Texas Award finalist. Her short stories have appeared in several anthologies, including Murder on Wheels, which won the Silver Faustian Award in 2016. Her novella with Manning Wolf, Last Call, is a 2020 Silver Faustian Award finalist. Her short story, The Deed, appeared in the 2019 Boucher Khan anthology, Denim, Diamonds, and Death. She lives with her family in Texas Hill Country. Find her online at her website, lauraoles.com. And we have Helen Curry Foster, who lives in north of Dripping Strings, Texas, supervised by three boroughs. She's deeply curious, more every day about human history and prehistory, and how, uninvited, the past keeps crashing the party. Foster earned her BA from Wesley College, MA from the University of Texas, and JD from the University of Michigan, where she grew fascinated with dirt and water law. After practicing environmental law and regulatory lit litigation for 30 years, she found the character Alice had suddenly appeared in her life. Foster is active with the Austin Shakespeare and the Heart of Texas Sisters in Crime. Find her online website, HelenCurryFoster.com, and Helen Curry Foster on Facebook. And we have two-time USA Today bestseller and author K.M. Hodge, who grew up in Detroit, where she spent most of her free time weaving wild tales to spook her friends and family. These days, she lives in Texas with her husband and two energetic boys, and once again enjoys writing tales of suspense and intrigue that keep her readers up all night. Her stories, which focus on women's issues, friendship, addiction, regrets, and second chances will stay with you long after you finish them. When she isn't writing or being an agent of social change, she reads independent graphic novels, watches old X-File episodes, streams Detroit Tigers games, and binges on Netflix with her husband. She enjoys hearing from her readers, so don't be shy about dropping her a line. Cam Hodge was awarded the winter of 2016 Pinnacle Book Achievement Award for her Red on the Run. You can sign up for new release emails and get a free gift at kmhodge.com. So uh, let's have each of us, each of you guys tell us a little bit about your uh, most recent book and some of your other books. I'm going to start with Helen, who's on the top for me here. <laughs> okay. Uh, the most recent is Ghost Cat. Ghost Cat just came out in May. And uh, it's my favorite, really, so far. But, of course, all, your, all of your books, the, the newest is the favorite. This one, though, um, brings home some of the issues in the Hill Country right now. And Texas is a big state. We're talking about Texas as a setting. But my piece of it is the Hill Country, which has great characters, terrible weather, ferocious animals, all the good stuff to write about. Here we have a flood, and we have a lot of floods out here, and people die. You know, the don't drown, turn around. Well, so in this book, we have that. We also have an issue of the wedding, the invasion of the wedding venues, which has hit the hill country, and the, uh, uh, the issues, the ongoing issues of undocumented workers who live here, have been here for some of them all their lives, or almost all their lives, and the issues they face. And so Alice gets into all of those in Ghost Cat, and uh, uh, she also has to deal with a terrible neighbor down the creek from her who is involved in a couple of murders. So that's Ghost Cat. That's Ghost Cat. Uh, and if you want me to talk about the setting, I would say that people come to the Hill Country because it's so beautiful, but it's got this rocky, rocky history of strife, and it's a hell of a place to try to raise a crop or, or actually make a living, and yet it is so beautiful. And, of course, it's got everything, you know, centipedes, tarantulas, scorpions, all the spiny stuff, and some ferocious animals. I went out in my yard this morning to look up at the stars, and I heard... 
we've got some kind of feral raccoon out there that doesn't think he has to share the yard with us now. So they're, you know, they're, but, but the hill country, I've loved it ever since the first time I, I saw it. So that's my place. Wonderful. All right, Laura, how about you? So Daughters of Bad Men was the first, it's in the Jamie Rush mystery series. And uh, she's a skip tracer in the fictional town of Port Aline, which I fashioned somewhat as a sibling to Port Aransas, Texas. Uh, we've spent a lot of time there with our family growing up, and um, I just love that area. Um, just such interesting people and a very um, uh, kind of fun, um, different places to go. It's, it's much more relaxed. Um, but I kept envisioning kind of a darker side to it because um, my mind tends to do that pretty much in a lot of places that I go. Um, so that started the first, um, the first book and then the next one, um, will be out hopefully next summer. And then I've had, um, a few short stories and anthologies, which I've really enjoyed writing short stories, um, just because I feel like it gives me an opportunity to play with an idea that I don't know if it has legs to carry a full book. And so for me, that's been fun to kind of maybe play with some different kinds of characters and, um, but just on a, on a smaller level. Um, so then we had uh, Last Call, which um, Helen also has. We have um, the bullet books, which are kind of like speed reads. And so that was a novella um, that came out last fall. Awesome. Yeah. And Cam, let's have you tell us about your titles. So I've got a four book series that takes place mostly not in Texas. There's like part of it that does, but mostly takes place in the D.C. metro area. But the rest of my stuff is all Texas-based. Um, I have a modern-day Texas and a 1970s, early 80s Texas. So my Walker, Texas is one of the other series I have that's kind of a play on all things funny Texas. So the first one's Walker, Texas Wife. Um, the second one is Remember the Stilettos. Um, and then there's, uh, Texas and tiaras and, uh, ladies, we have a problem. <laughs> so kind of a fun, it's a little more humorous and light and it's for my little ladies who don't like swearing. Um, so there's no swearing. It's very light, um, and funny. And then I have another series that is, um, summer of 79, seven, summer of 78, fall of 79, and then winter of 80. And that takes place in Austin area. And this series takes place mostly in like a fictional Dripping Springs area. So. Very cool. Great. So um, for you guys, what kind of comes first? Uh, the characters or the setting? I'm going to start with Helen because from your bio, it sounds like maybe Alice came first. Is that true? <laughs> Alice did come first. She did. She appeared. Uh, I'd been at a very obnoxious meeting, and uh, I'd been thinking about writing a murder mystery for a long time, and I came, and Alice was absolutely in a murderous rage after that meeting. I thought, I think I found my voice. So that's, that's Alice. Uh, okay, she, these are based in Coffee Creek, Texas, which is somewhere between Dripping Springs and Fredericksburg, and it doesn't exist, of course, but that means you can have it the way you want. Uh, and so Alice, uh, Alice is pretty introverted, but she uh, is absolutely committed to her clients. And so she's a pretty driven character, but she gets to meet some really cool characters. And they all have real roots. I mean, I cannot say that I totally invented any of them except maybe Eddie Lafarge, the retired uh, pro football center. He's, um, he just appeared one day in the central garage. I don't know how that happened. And he asked Alice, he said, that's your truck out there? So that, that's how the, the characters happen. Uh, one of them is Ollie in, the very first, in my first book. I hated to kill him, but Ollie was based on Ollie West, who was this absolutely turtle-mouthed, stern old cowboy that always wore his gray chinos in his hat. And he ran Mo Ranch out on the Guadalupe River. He ran it. And we, we summer employees lived in total terror of Ollie. So, I mean, yeah, so that's Ollie. Uh, uh, the characters are part of the setting. The setting is critical to me, absolutely critical, 
because I'm so enchanted by this landscape and its violence. I mean, it's a violent landscape. And some of the people are, are that way, too. And a lot of violent stuff has happened in the Hill Country. Well, it's happened all over Texas, but we've got our own kind of violent history. Uh, but, the, but Alice's problems arise from trying to do the right thing for her clients, which, of course, we love in a protagonist. She's not perfect by any means, and she's not always as smart as she should be, but she is absolutely determined to get done what they hired her to get done. So that's got a certain Texas-y, swaggery quality to it. Yeah. The setting, so, uh, the setting is, is how people talk, too. You know? I mean, Texas is a big place, and the accents are different all over Texas, and then we have different layers of accents. I like to have some of that re reflected in the dialogue, but it's kind of like when you're salting your food. You don't want too much of it, but you need some of it. So that is always a challenge that requires a lot of listening to people and thinking, how, 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 how does he say that? You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's fun. All right, KM, how, um, for you, what's come first, characters or the setting? Absolutely, characters. Uh, the characters come at me right away, but the setting is a very close second. The setting, I think, sometimes is so interwoven within the characters, kind of like Helen said, they kind of go together. But I think I hear the characters are just louder than the setting. <laughs> so the characters drive where I'm going, but the setting is the road. So, you know, I have to follow the road. Very cool. Laura, how about for you? Yeah, Can definitely char it? characters for me also. Um, and then sometimes I just get a random piece of dialogue in my head. I don't know who it belongs to yet, but, you know, I'll get a sentence or two and just kind of, you know, you kind of have to let it roll around to figure out who it belongs to. Um, so a lot of times I have the characters before I figure out, you know, what they're doing, but definitely setting for me was a close second also, just because I love this area. Um, you know, there's some, there's just some very specific things about it that I feel like, um, in terms of writing about said, you could also show how the setting impacts the characters, you know, through their behaviors, through their interactions with one another, how they spend their time. Um, so there are other ways to do that outside of just simply, you know, describing the area. Yeah. Sticking with you, Laura, um, for the fictional versus real, why might you choose one or the other? Um, I can imagine some reasons. <laughs> yeah, there's some, um, you know, it's interesting because I thought originally about trying to write, you know, um, something specific like two Port Aransas, but, you know, there were some things I wanted to play with. Um, I wanted to make um, the area kind of have a darker layer and things that I just felt like it would be better to um, create a sibling city to it. Um, I felt like I could do that in a way that was still, you know, honored all the wonderful things about Port Aransas and still have some fun with, um, you know, the fictional aspects of it. Um, you know, it's interesting. People that know an area will be very exacting also. You know, when you write a certain area, there's always that worry that if you don't want something um, exactly right. And also too, you know, places change, you know, over time. So a building that you might remember being in place in one area wouldn't be now, and especially like if you think about what happened with Hurricane Harvey, um, you know, all kinds of landmarks through uh, Port Aransas and Rockport, places that I, you know, remember looking for to make a certain turn that aren't there anymore. Um, you know, and, and you want to show respect in how you write that also. Um, but what's interesting is that, you know, Laura Lippman, who you know, in her uh, Tess Monahan series, wrote a lot about Baltimore because that was her, that was her love, her city. Um, and she said that, you know, she writes it. I mean, she knows every single thing about that. You know, she knows every inch of that city. But she said if she needs a fictional building somewhere, she's going to put it there, you know, for the story, which I thought was fantastic. I thought, oh, my gosh, you can actually do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and she does it. She does it just so well. Um, so I might try to, you know, choose a, an actual location at some point, but I'm really having fun kind of taking elements from a couple of places and putting them together. So I take like elements of, um, you know, Rockport or Flower Bluff or those kind of surrounding areas and, and play with it. Yeah. Helen, you said yours is a fictional city is, um, why did you choose that over doing a real city? 
Well, part of it is exactly what Laura was saying. People can be very exacting. And they all, they still come up and say, now, that's really this place, isn't it? You were really writing about this restaurant, weren't you? And I do put some real ones in down in Wimberley or somewhere. But uh, the beer barn is a very important core to this little town of Coffee Creek. I've always loved a real Texas roadhouse. And this one has got, you know, a Czech and a Latino and a... Um, a German guy running it, and they it's got great music, it's got a great cook, and it's a totally wonderful place for the, for the characters to meet up. So, Dripping Springs doesn't have a, <laughs> the beer barn. <laughs> so you got I wish it did. I wish it did. And yeah. It's, it's given rise to some, some good plot elements, too. So, you can, if you can fiddle with your, your city, and it's familiar enough that people think, oh, Laura's really writing about that place we stayed last summer, or Helen is just talking about that little dance hall that's right down on Mercer Street, then they are very, they're very happy about that, that's even if they're wrong. Yeah. Cam, so you said D.C. Metro, so that's a real place. Um, did you uh, choose that specifically to the story, um, and would you choose a fictional now, if you had the chance? So that was the first books that I wrote. Um, so there's lots of things that I probably would have done differently, but there are FBI agents working in the main FBI building in DC. So for the story's sake, I needed it to happen there. Um, and like I say in my bio, I was madly obsessed with the X-Files. So I have X-Files stuff peppered throughout all of my books. And if you're an X-Files fan, you will notice. If you're not, it'll go right over your head. Um, so because of my interest in that area and I've been there lots of times and I had maps and I did lots of research and stuff, um, I did keep it real, but a lot of it takes place in fictional places too. I have a town called Danville that I completely made up. It's the name of a town in Illinois. Um, that I just liked the name. And so I moved it over into Virginia. And so there was some made up stuff and some real things. Um, like in my other Texas series, Austin is in it, but it's vague things about Austin. And I like to keep it vague because you're not going to offend anybody. You can be more creative and it's more fun sometimes to make, I mean, that's what we do. We make stuff up. So, um, I like to just make stuff up. I don't know if you can tell, but this right here is a little chibi scully and molder that my coworker has at her desk. She is also that's an awesome. Xbox. <laughs> I'm going to have to forward her info to you uh, or it's so around cool. your, your info to her. <clears throat> so sticking with you then Cam, why, since you're in Texas, why set your other stories in Texas? Because you're here, it's what you see or for another reason. Um, I love Texas. I lived here for 17, almost 18 years now. Um, so basically my whole adult life. Um, and it's awesome. Texas is just cool. It's kind of like New York. It's its own character. So um, I also like to have a lot of my characters be Catholic because there's lots of interesting things along with it. I'm not Catholic, but I like the traditions and the different aspects of it that make the story and the characters richer and it just adds more to it. So Texas is just cool. And so why not write about Texas? Everybody loves Texas. <laughs> I do agree. Laura, how about for you? Why say your stories in Texas? Um, well, I came here um, toward the end of high school. So I was an Air Force brat. So I moved from year to year to year to year <laughs> and then landed here um, at the end of high school and um, just loved the area and stayed. So um, for me, I, I'm a transplant, but I've been here almost 30 years now. Um, so I really, um, I've just enjoyed, I love that you can drive different parts of the state and they're so different you know like what you're going to see in north texas and what you're going to see in san antonio and they each have their own unique kind of personality and you can almost spot it you know you can almost see it morphing from one one element to another as you're driving down 35 um so for me i love that so we always joke that when you see the pot you know when you see the palm trees going south um you know you're getting close to corpus 
Um, but I just love that they each have their own personality. So there as many, there's no, um, there might be some kind of general ideas of what a Texan is, but there's so many variations, which is, is something that I love about the area. Awesome. And Helen, why is that your stories in Texas? Well, I mean, born and born and bred in Texas and born out in West Texas, which I think makes you forever imprinted on the big sky, as opposed to somebody who's born in East Texas, it's going to be pine trees. Uh, I love the storytelling tradition in Texas. We're a tall, you know, we like those tall tales. Mm -hmm. And uh, I I was thinking about it. I was thinking about Lonesome Dove, you know, our kind of archetypal cowboy saga. And, and, and his second book, which was in the Dwayne Moore, I guess, uh, series, when McMurtry ha- opens that book, Texasville, Dwayne was in the hot tub shooting at his new doghouse with a 44 Magnum. Now, to me, I mean, he switched from Lonesome Dove to Dwayne sitting in the hot tub, and there is something about that that was so... I'm going to write about Texas today, and sure, you can just imagine this person out sitting in but, but it's but it's larger than life it's he's got a gun that's larger than life he's shooting at his two-story doghouse it's just a tall tale and so the tall tales attract me and the way people talk attracts me i love to listen to some people there's a very laconic way that people talk that's kind of you know there's that and then there's the totally exaggerated uh it's the biggest it's the horriblest it's the worst it's you know I just I like the way people talk and I love to I love to hear those tall tales from whatever region of the state we got them. See, we really do. It's been great. I'm about five years here and I just love hearing it all and taking it all in. Um, so let's talk a little bit about using Texas history and contemporary Texas mystery fiction. So, Helen, you actually mentioned it, that there is a, this tough history where you are and how do you work that in? That's really that, that's true, and I've tried to do that in in all six books so far. The first one starting way back with uh, Cave Art, because we have this history. We talk about the frontier, but there is this long history of Native Americans here, and so that one. Uh, the the third book, Ghost Letter, talks about uh, Kelly Air Force Base when it was such an important center of of early flight for the U.S. What became the Air Force. Uh, and a murder there. Uh, today's history, I mean, talking about the the, um, the changes that we're seeing right now so rapidly, we're in this enormous urbanization. When I talk about the, the wedding venue mushrooming out here, it's because Austin is growing so fast. This is just, it's just incredible. And that's happening all over Texas. So, so history is really important, but at the back of it, we have got our favorite characters the campfire storytellers about the cattle drives, about the terrible, I was looking up Charlie Seringo. I mean, he wrote a book back in 1885 called A Texas Cowboy or 15 Years on the Hurricane Deck of a Spanish Pony. I mean, he's making it funny, but it's grandiose. It's, it's, it's big. So, and that was a, that's a real part of the history. So yes, I try to, our current history is also important. And yeah. the issues we've got today. Yeah. Pam, hey, have you used uh, Texas history um, in your Texas mysteries? And have- um, so a little bit. Uh, so I do have my one series that takes place in the late 70s, early 80s. And so I did talk to a lot of people that were around at the time in here. And just to get an idea of the feel, you know, for how it looked and the fact that Caning Road used that was like firm from then on. Um, and how different that is now. So some things I used and pulled. So the that series all came about because a friend sent me an article about Willie Nelson and um, the, the whole musical movement of the late 70s um, for the outlaw country. And so from there, I created this character who really just wanted to go see Willie Nelson and was going to hitchhike um, to go see a Willie Nelson concert because she just really wanted to go. Um, But a lot of my stuff is 
more based on uh, how women are treated. So across the board for no matter what year I'm writing, a lot of it is uh, more of the trials and struggles that women have. So one of my characters is assaulted. How do people respond to that? How does society respond to that? And I think it's pretty similar to how things are happening even today. So some things kind of traverse history and still exist now. So, yeah. Laura, have you pulled in um, Texas history in any way to your? You know, I do a couple of nods, for example, um, you know, in Port Aransas, you know, it has a history with the Farley boats, you know, like the, um, they're the really shallow uh, boats that start when um, in the early 1900s when Port Aransas was, you know, booming, becoming more of a, a fishing town. That you know, the the Gulf Coast waters were very difficult to navigate, and so they needed another form of um, not really like a skiff, but like more of a shallow boat to be able to um, to navigate those waters and bring things in and out of port. So uh, the Farley family spent three generations um, uh, building these boats and providing them. Um, and even now, so when you drive through Port Aransas, you'll see there's little planters that are Farley boat planters. They're like people plant flowers in them um, and you can count them. I think I counted about 70. One time we did just a whole run. And so there's still that nod there. So, you know, little things like that, but more, more in terms of the, um, of the fishing community and, you know, how it has built itself, um, you know, along Mustang Island. That's really so, cool. Yeah, um, and that actually leads really good into the next question um, that I want to go with is what are some of the ways you set the stage for your reader, like showing that it's a fishing community like that? Um, lots of description or let the reader fill in the spaces. So we'll start with Laura. Um, you know, I try not to be too heavy handed with it. Um, you know, so a lot of times they'll reveal it in dialogue, you know, because honestly, like I have a friend who um, she commented that, you um, you know, she just, it's just so hot in August. It was just like, you know, just, it's just so just beastie and humid. And, um, you know, it kind of tests you in ways only a local would understand. And so um, I try to use either the dialogue in between the characters or how they're responding to um, the heat and the ongoing wind and kind of the unpredictability of the weather, um, you know, quite a bit. So I try to use it in, in those ways and certainly in some of the settings. So when you're trying to describe buildings, um, not only the way that they're built and materials are built with, but they just get, they just get really, really beaten by the elements. And so, um, you know, something that might do well up in the North, you know, you, you put it down in South Texas and the heat and the salt water and the wind will just, um, you know, take its toll pretty quickly. And so I try to use those particular elements when I'm, you know, describing an area or a particular location. Um, but also I like to do a lot of it through the dialogue and how the characters respond to the elements as opposed to just describing the elements themselves. Helen, is it the same for you to use the dialogue to set um, the stage or what are some other ways you use to set the stage for the reader? Usually, in a, these are classic mysteries and so we fairly quickly into the action. And so the dialogue has to express that, the shock, the finding, the what in the world could have started this. So that has to happen very quickly, and it's done both with the setting and, and with dialogue. Uh, I have been trying to put more description in, but it is, but Laura is right, it has to be done so deftly that it's just an integral part of the scene. It is, it's not a, oh, now I'm going to write a paragraph about how nice live oaks are. It's, they've got to be built into the plot and the scene. And uh, because in the, at least in the mystery world, whereas you do leave some red herrings, you don't want to just drive a reader crazy with extraneous stuff. So it's part of the right job is to prune prune those oak trees <laughs> yeah cam for you um what are some of the ways you set the stage for your readers i like to do it also through dialogue to keep it sparse for descriptions just because otherwise you know like helen said you're leading your reader to a place where they think they need to pay attention to this but they're not and i think that um, also messes with the timing and 
just the timber of the story. And if you don't get that right, it everything just falls apart. Um, and you're going to lose the reader really quickly. So try and find creative ways to using it within the dialogue and just the action of the story. So the actual physical bodies and how they're in, you know, interacting with the environment. Excellent. Um, so we are getting at least even with um, uh, starting a little later, we're probably getting close to 45 minutes. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and ask the um, question that we got from our audience, somebody that submitted and have you guys, um, Kay, and we'll start with you. What are some common mistakes for aspiring writers? Um, head hopping is a big one. Whenever I read really new writers, it's just understanding who's talking with a point of view and not bouncing all of them back and forth because it gets super confusing really quickly. Um, learning how to frame your dialogue in ways that aren't just said. Um, so making the story flow a little bit better. Um, length of sentences, varying lengths. Um, that's a real pet peeve of mine. I was reading a story the other day and actually sent a screenshot to a writer friend of mine. I'm like, it is like all run on sentences. <laughs> There's no variation. And I'm losing track of what the person's trying to say. And it's really, really confusing. So having varying sentence lengths, little subtle things, I think are what makes the difference between someone who's a more seasoned writer and somebody who's starting off. That's really good um, advice. Helen, um, how about for you? What are common mistakes that you see with aspiring writers? Well, what she said, but also keep writing. If you, I, I once went and read, I think the first by P.D. James, the first by Dorothy Sayers, the first by Reginald Hill, who was just a phenomenal British writer. And you read those first books and, you, and then you read the second and you think, honey, you learned something. This, it, it's the first book sometimes has a little Frankenstein quality. You know, the characters are a little clunky, and then they really learn to walk and talk in the second or third book. So come on, aspiring writers, keep at it. There you go. Laura, what's your advice for aspiring writers? No, no Helen's advice about, you know, to keep at it, I think, is, is excellent. Um, I also think that it's really important to be a big reader, um, I think that is a critical component of being a writer is you need to read a lot and read widely. Um, don't, um, I wouldn't box yourself into an idea of you need to read one particular thing or what, just make sure that you're reading a lot. And really you can learn from all kinds of stories. Um, and I think you start to get um, an education too as you go from one reader to another, like point of view. Like, do you want to write, you know, in first person, first person, um, which I love reading, you know, is much more intimate. Um, but it also does offer some limitations in terms of how you tell the story because everything's from that character's perspective and what they know um, versus like third person. And now you see some people writing, you know, going back and forth between a first and third. So by reading other people that you enjoy reading and seeing how they do those things, not only do you enjoy the story, but you also kind of get a little bit of an education also in terms of, of how they how they structure that. I think you just inherently pick up learning um, structure and those kind of things and rhythm uh, through a lot of reading. That's really awesome. Well, I really, first, before we get to our last little bit, um, which will be our two truths and a lie, folks who are watching this will hopefully have seen within the last little while, um, putting out three statements from each of our authors, two of which are true and one of which is a blatant lie. Um, and so we're going to go through and I will read the three items for each author. And then the other two ladies um, who I'm not talking about, will take a guess and then we'll reveal who, which is the lie. Um, but first I would definitely want to say thank you, ladies. Um, it has been wonderful talking to you tonight and I really hope our viewers enjoy this and we'll come back again for the next in the series um, and look for all of your books and works out there. So we're going to start with Laura. Um, our three statements are, uh, Laura once did a radio interview in her closet because her kids were involved in a very loud game of hide and seek. 
Um, we also have Laura consistently writes each day, often in the mornings, and hits a thousand words per day when on a project. And our third statement is Laura often moves around the house to work from office desk to outdoor chair. So, Helen, what do you think is um, the lie in that? Well, I mean, I know that she has active children, so I can't say the first one. And I know she's a very active person. Um, and she is so productive that it can't possibly be the second one. So I'm going to say she moves around the house to work from office chair to outdoor chair. All right. Um, Kim, do you have a theory on which one might be the lie? I had two kids who I had to just mute myself to make sure you didn't hear them screaming. <laughs> Girl, if you're writing a thousand words every single day, you are amazing and you're my new hero. So I'm going to say that's I hope is a lie. <laughs> <laughs> and we will do our reveal you are right Cam it is that Laura consistently writes each day and often hits a thousand words per day when on a project Laura is that is that close? that's a, that's a big old lie <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it does do, and, and so Cam will appreciate this too with kids. Mine are older, but you know, with everybody being home the last several months and doing online classes, and um, my husband working from home and me working from home, we're we're all moving around the house trying to figure out where we can be quiet when we have online meetings and uh, classes and things like that. Um, so for me, I tend to go in, you know, every I think I tend to go in in different spurts. Like if I have a deadline, then that's one thing. Um, then I can figure out I'll end up, you know, adjusting my schedule to try to really focus. Um, but you know, our, our lives are kind of all over the place. So I'm squeezing things in at different times and just trying to write. Um, I try to look at the week as opposed to the day. So that, you know, I try to do is look at when's my word count when something is due by the end of the week, as opposed to every day, because sometimes I just, you know, I'll just beat myself up if I have a couple of days that go off the rails, which they often do. Um, you know, with work and, and family and, and other things going on. So. Excellent. Yeah. I would love to be that person though. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to go um, to Helen next, I believe. There we go. Where'll it go? There it goes. Yes. So Helen's three statements are Helen adheres to Flannery O'Connor's injunction to write two hours a day at the same time in the same place. Uh, then Helen jumped off a moving train the first day of college. And our third statement is Helen tried to run over the family doctor with her tricycle. Laura, what do you think is the uh, not true statement there? Oh, my goodness. I like all of these. Um, you know, I know that Helen is also a very busy person. So I'm and I just I just can kind of see her jumping off of a moving train. Honestly, <laughs> I love that idea. Um, so. I'm going to say that it's the first one, writing two, day, two hours a day at the same time in the same place. And Cam, what do you think might be the lie in these three? I really want it to be the first the lie because the other two sound really funny. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If that's your guess, you guys are actually both right. Yes. <laughs> it is awesome that you dreamt off a moving train the first day of college. Uh, I was in Boston. And then I didn't know which train station to get off at. And I'd forgotten my brand new coat on the train that I bought in, in Texas to wear in Boston. And so my taxi driver said, oh, no problem. We'll catch it at North Station. But when we got to North Station and got on the train, not only was the coat not there, but the train began to move. <laughs> anyway, yeah. He said, have you ever jumped from a moving train? <laughs> Today's the day. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. And so the, um, if our first one was not true, how do you tend to write um, on your daily? Oh, it is sort of catch as catch can. And it's funny how sometimes something will come to you or come to probably every writer in the middle of the night. And you the next day is when you think, I have got to get that down. But you can't quite. So it's. It's sometimes a very strange time. I, I would like to write two hours a day in the morning, and that's what the sign on the office door says, but uh, it doesn't happen. And it's more like writing in the car, writing at a funny time in the afternoon, writing on a bus. It's That's when it gets done. It's Take it when it gets there. 
Yeah. Well, I think that's a great, um, Helen's uh, comment too, is just a great reminder for people who are trying to write because most people have jobs, side hustles, kids, all kinds of things that they're trying to balance while they're writing. So there's no one right way to do that. So as long as you just keep moving forward, however you can fit that into your life, you're going to get there. So, you know, don't feel that if you can't sit at your desk and do 500 or 1,000 words a day that you're not going to make it. I mean, because what happens is 100 words over time gets to be a habit of 200 words over time that gets to be, you know, you will build that, you will build that momentum. So don't, don't be afraid to start small because start small sticks. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. And KM, our three statements are, Kim has worked for two U.S. congressmen. Kim has been with her husband for over 20 years. And Kim has a master's in fine arts. Laura, what do you think might be the untrue statement there? Oh, this, this is a tough one because I know that she likes, I don't know, she seems like she's very creative. So I can see she would have a master's in fine arts. Um, I don't know. Um, I like all of these. <laughs> I'm going to, you know what? I, I think she actually worked for, I think she actually worked for the congressman. I'm going to, I'm going to go with the third one. Fine arts. All right. Alan, what do you think? <laughs> well, I thought KM had younger children. So I was beginning to think that maybe she'd only been with her husband for 19 years. And so that that wasn't true because she's got that DC connection. She likes graphic novels. So the first and third, mm -hmm. I, I'm so I was going to say maybe she's just not quite to 20 years. Okay. Those are some, that's why these are so great. Cam um, is, she does not have a master's in fine arts. Cam, what is, the, what are your degrees in? I have a bachelor's and master's in social work with a specialty in nonprofit management. <laughs> that is awesome. Did you work in that field before you started writing full time? I have been working in that field for 17 years wow. as a grant writer, marketing person, fundraiser, many hats. But uh, I've been with my husband since 1998. We weren't married until 2000, but we were together in 98. So I just say that because I know I look younger. So I always do that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one, Steve. Exactly. And I do have small children. I have a middle schooler and an elementary age student. So they're not really, really small, but they're also not like teenagers or anything quite yet. Well, that was a lot of fun. I really appreciate you ladies playing along with that little um, fun thing for me. Um, and with us, I think our viewers are going to get um, some enjoyment out of that. And let's just have you plug your up next upcoming project real quick, and we'll we'll end the evening. So, Laura, let's go ahead and start with you. Um, so, I have a couple of short stories coming out um, next year in anthologies. Um, one is um, a Jimmy Buffett anthology. It's all um, based on Jimmy Buffett songs, which is going to be really fun to see. Um, I think. I think they said it was coming out in the spring. And then I have the um, second Jamie Rush book out next summer. So that's called The Sound of Winter. Wonderful. I right, Kim, what have got coming up for us? Uh, my Sally Ride Chronicle just came out on audiobook finally. Um, and my readers will murder me if I don't come out with the third book for this. So I have like three chapters left to write. Very cool. I'll get it done eventually. I've been writing other things on my phone at night, which along with what the other lady said, yeah, if you don't just sit at your desk and write, that's, I don't know anyone who just does that. I'm sure there are people that do, but um, a lot of us do it wherever we can. And sometimes that means 1030 at night when I'm trying to get a kid to go to sleep and they need me to sit on the floor and I've got my phone, I can write in my Google Doc and get a couple of sentences in, so... Awesome. And Helen, what have you coming up for us? Uh, well, I'll tell you in just a second, but first I want to say thank you so much, Margaret, for putting this together and letting us have this much fun on a Monday night. And yes. we, we're grateful to your readers and hope they'll keep on reading. Um, Ghost, Ghost Cat, I'm about to start the Audible recording this week and next week, and, and also um, Ghost Letter. The others are on Audible, but i got to do those. And... Um, I have a new book coming out next summer, and it involves 
um, Alice again, and uh, the theft of some Gustav Baumann prints from Santa Fe. And if y'all y'all don't know who that is, you've seen the work and you loved it. So let me just say, I hope that's going to be a fun one. I believe it. And, and <laughs> thank you again, Margaret. You're very welcome. Thank you very much, ladies, for sending me, giving me an hour of your time tonight. I really appreciate it. And um, we'll talk to you again. Okay. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye. I really enjoyed Bye. this. Bye. So much fun. Bye, Laura. Bye, KM. Bye. Good night, ladies. <laughs> Good night.